You know the Klingon proverb that tells us revenge is a dish that is best served cold. It is very cold. I know what you're thinking. What does Without Remorse have to do with movies like Gladiator, Braveheart, Mad Max, A Man Apart and The Crow? They're all revenge narrative stories where the protagonist loses his wife and kid and sets out on a path of revenge. And in this breakdown of Without Remorse, I will be going over five key elements every good revenge narrative should have. And comparing without remorse to these similar movies. This is a film adaptation of Tom Clancy's 1993 novel Without Remorse. In 1994, Keanu Reeves was offered $7 million for the role, but turned it down. <gasps> and can you blame him? He did Speed, which set him on a path to do Matrix. The project was shut down that was set to star Lawrence Fishburne of Boys in the Hood and Gary Sinise of Forrest Gump. Tom Hardy was also set to star as John Kelly. This makes the second team up between Italian director Stefano Salima, best known for his gritty crime drama films and director of the sequel to Sicario, and writer Taylor Sheridan, best known for his role as Deputy Hale on The Sons of Anarchy, and was also the director to Those Who Wish Me Dead, starring Angelina Jolie. This movie is starring Michael B. Jordan. He plays John Kelly, a U.S. Navy SEAL who sets out on a path of revenge after his pregnant wife and unit members are killed by Russian hitmen. Now, when I think of a really good revenge movie, I think of 1973's Lady Snowblood. <laughs> in which Quentin Tarantino plays tribute with Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2. I think of John Wick movies. <laughs> 2003's Old Boy. I tend to like movies where something unfortunate happens to the character and then he sets out on a path of revenge. I was first introduced to the revenge narrative driven story with 1979's Mad Max starring Mel Gibson on a budget of 400K and earned over $100 million worldwide. It held the Guinness record for most profitable film. The chain in those handcuffs is high tensile steel. If you're lucky, you can hack through your ankles. And spawning two more sequels, Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, and Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. And that was my favorite as a kid with Tina Turner's Aunt Entity. Welcome to another edition of Thunderdome! Let's not forget Mad Max Fury Road. How can you not root for the good guy gone bad? Which brings me to the first element you need in a revenge driven story. Number one, character motive, your protagonist, the warrior. We first learned that John Kelly is a heavily trained U.S. Navy SEAL. <laughs> You comedian, is that it? Yeah, he's, uh, he's more of a badass. Oh. After a mission seems fishy, he's the ex-Russian military. You said Syrian army. They're RPG'd in a formation that looked more like the flying V from Mighty Ducks. He leaps right into action to save his lieutenant commander, Karen Greer, played by Jody Turner-Smith, who was in Queen Slim. I'll never let go of your hand and is married to Mr. Mighty Ducks himself. <laughs> she asked you? She asked me, yeah. On New Year's Eve, we were in Nicaragua. He leaves nobody behind as we quickly learn that this is somebody you don't want to mess with. Similar to A Man Apart, starring Vin Diesel. When we see his character leap into action, going beyond his fellow officers to achieve his goal. The best example of this would be in Gladiator, starring Russell Crowe where we learn that Maximus is a respected general and even more so a better fighter. Also somebody you're not gonna wanna trifle with. Then we see the other side of our warrior, the softer side of our hero, 
John Kelly is married to his pregnant wife, played by Lauren London, and he's retired from the military and is leaving his past behind him. His motive is to live a normal life. In A Man Apart, we see a softer side of Sean. He returns home to his wife, and we see how in love he is with her. In Gladiator, Maximus just wants to return home to his wife and son. When was the last time you were home? Two years, 264 days, and this morning. Another version of this character type would be our tragic hero. Let's take 1994's The Crow, starring Brandon Lee, where we take a normal guy, something bad happens to him, sending him on a path to become the warrior. Another good example of this would be Braveheart. William Wallace just wants to get married, have kids, and farm, which leads me to our second element needed in a good revenge narrative. Number two, inciting incident, push towards revenge. What happens to upset the hero? This is the moment that pushes our hero towards the path of revenge. And without remorse, Kelly is downstairs listening to the song Woe by Sonoa Allegra. Michael B. Jordan was also in the video after a coincidental run with her in Berlin during the shooting of this movie. As his wife is asleep upstairs, we see through night vision goggles as his wife is murdered in her sleep. The music of this movie, done by Jonesy, really adds another level of intensity to this scene. <laughs> as Kelly slowly crawls to his wife and then realizes she's dead. In Braveheart, Wallace rescues his wife from being raped by English soldiers. But as he tries to lead the soldiers away, she is captured and publicly executed in one of the colder death scenes. In Hard to Kill, Mason Storm's wife is gunned down. In Gladiator, Maximus' wife and son are burned to death. The best scene to me showcasing this emotion was 2003's A Man Apart. Similar to being attacked at his home, his peace, after killing both shooters, he goes inside to learn that his wife has been shot. That moment when she tells him to look at her. Look at me. The fact that she dies in his arms pulls you more into the exciting incident. You feel for him. What John Wick did was play on your emotions, but a different spin. Instead of losing his wife to somebody, he loses his wife to natural causes. Then the dog that his wife got him was murdered, giving him the push towards revenge. The number three key element in a revenge driven narrative is villains. <laughs> After the exciting incident in a revenge narrative movie comes one question. Who is responsible? The more important the villain, the stronger the revenge narrative. Who is he to your protagonist? There are many different ways to flesh out the villain. In Christopher Nolan's Memento, starring Guy Pierce, he sends you on a journey the entire movie as Leonard Shelby tries to figure out who kills his wife. In Mad Max, he knows exactly who it is, the Knight Rider gang, led by Toe Carter. <laughs> played by the late Hugh Keyes Byrne, who also played a Morden Joe in Mad Max Fury Road. In John Wick, he knows it's Vigo's son, and they know what they're up against. In Gladiator, Maximus knows it was Commodus. Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance. And without remorse, Kelly has to go on a journey to find out information about who's responsible. With his first action being the extremes he goes through to appear like he's drunk, to the extremes of what he did to find out the information of the person responsible. Better you go death your follow up. Yeah. Then he gets closer to him and you learn that he's just a pawn with a bigger villain still out there. Movies like The Crow play on this aspect. After taking out T-Bird, Funboy, Tintin, and Skank, we learn that Top Dollar, played by Michael Wincott, is actually the one who gave the order. In Braveheart, all the soldiers were just pawns. With King Edward I, Who is this person who speaks to me as though I needed his advice? 
being the main antagonist. Not I. If I fell under the sword of that murderer, it might be my head. Not my gentle son. Top Dollar is a good example of a good villain. And outside of sleeping with his sister, before it became a thing in Game of Thrones. Everything they say is true about Jamie and me. No. He figured out the source of the crow's power, taking it away from him, and was a gloat or two away from winning. You got a lot of spirits, son. I am gonna miss you. Just like my boy Oberyn. Say it! Which brings us to our number four key element, the quest for revenge, steady escalation. This is why we watch revenge movies. We want to see the trail of bodies left behind by our protagonists. The best example of steady escalation would be Daredevil season two with the Punisher, played by John Bernthal. His performance as Frank Castle is amazing. The steady escalation and the amount of bodies he gets on his quest for revenge is why people dubbed him the Punisher. He showed you that he was willing to stop at nothing to avenge his family. I'll do this with you. John Kelly goes through more obstacles than he does bodies. After finding out the name Victor Rykoff, he's sent to prison for what he did to the guy in the car. Then he goes through an obstacle of geared up police officers, joins the military again to stop Victor, and then the plane is shot down, and then it becomes an obstacle of his underwater training as he saves the gear needed to complete the mission. It's not up until Victor Rykoff reveals that there's somebody else behind it before he takes his own life. And in that moment, John Kelly realizes he has to save his team and survive so that he can find out who's really behind it. So really, up until that point, he just left a trail of one body. The Crow took out one criminal at a time until going after what he thought was the last guy involved. And then he went through a table full of people until finally getting a skank. In Braveheart, William Wallace instantly gets revenge on the exact person who killed his wife, killing soldier after soldier after soldier. His quest for revenge went past this moment starting a rebellion and his rage over his wife carried him up until the end. And now we get to our fifth and final key element you need in a revenge driven narrative story. Revenge is a journey, not a destination. Does your hero succeed in his quest for revenge? And what does he learn? John Kelly pulls himself out of hell in order to go ghost and uncover the real killer. getting his revenge against the person behind it and having a moment with his wife. Are you in heaven? I'm with you. And the music by Jonesy just really adds to this scene. Not always. No, not all. But now. Another example would be a man apart. After Sean leaves a trail of bodies on his quest, once figuring out the real man behind it, he overcomes his own need for revenge by achieving the goal he had in the first place. If I wanted you dead, you would be. Braveheart would be the best example of this. Despite being tortured, he remains strong in his original idea of being a free man all the way up until the end. So based off these five key elements, without remorse, has a lot of remorse and falls to the bottom of the list of revenge driven movies. Despite having a strong protagonist in John Kelly and pulling you into the story with the inciting incident, without remorse doesn't deliver a strong antagonist. <sighs> which doesn't lead to a better quest for revenge and the steady escalation is John going through obstacles, which leads to the information, to the next piece of information. In fact, John only left a trail of one body. It's not up until the end where he goes on his rampage, 
but the motivation is to save his team and not avenge his wife. His journey of revenge was more about obstacles to obtain information that led him right to the man who killed his wife and he doesn't get revenge. When John gets to his destination of revenge, the dish is served quite warm and not cold at all to the point where we don't even care. And for that reason, I'm going to give without remorse a 5.5 5 out of 10. If you like this video and want to see more, click here for my breakdown of Thunder Force or click here to watch my show Coffee and Trailers. And as always, until next time.